In our previous video, we did a brief overview of post-translational modification. Now, let's discuss how mass spectrometry can be used to analyze protein molecules and study post-translational modification of proteins. Recall from our previous video that a protein molecule is a string of amino acids that has been folded into a functional form. Additionally, we discussed a type of post-translational modification called phosphorylation, which adds a phosphate group to a protein molecule to result in an action, such as activation. Now that we understand these concepts, we can discuss the process of mass spectrometry. The general workflow can be broken up into three main steps. It begins with sample preparation. Prepared samples are then placed in the mass spectrometer, and once the experiment is complete, the results are analyzed. We will briefly be reviewing each of these steps, beginning with sample preparation. If the proteins we are interested in come from something such as cell tissue, then the first step will be to extract the protein molecules and isolate them from other molecules we are not interested in, such as carbohydrates or lipids. A mass spectrometer cannot accurately read full-length protein molecules. Therefore, the protein molecules that have been extracted need to be digested or broken down into smaller pieces, which are called peptides. The most common digestion performed is trypsin digestion, which cleaves protein molecules after a lysine or arginine amino acid, except when bound to a C-terminal proline. Now, that may seem a little confusing, so let's take a look at the sequence shown here. Each letter is the shorthand code for an amino acid, so you should see this string of letters as a string of amino acids. Where you see scissors, trypsin is cutting after an arginine, represented by R, or after a lysine, represented by K. Now what about these locations, where there is an R or K present, but trypsin has not made a cut? Well, you'll notice that each of these is followed by a proline, represented by P, so a cut is not made. Finally, after trypsin has digested the protein, the mass spectrometer can only read peptides with lengths of 5 to 50 amino acids. Therefore, the peptides shown here that are under 5 amino acids in length have been X'd out since they will not be read. Now that your samples are prepared, the next step is to run the LC-MSMS experiments in our mass spectrometer. I would like to note that for the remainder of this video, in order to help you better understand these concepts, I will be discussing mass spectrometry in a very simplified and theoretical manner. In other words, this will be the very basics of mass spectrometry in a perfect ideal world. However, as is the case with most areas of science, nothing ever works out perfectly, and mass spectrometry is much more complex in practice. Now, picking up where we left off, our peptides are placed in the mass spectrometer, where they first undergo ionization. Ionization is where the peptides are transformed from a liquid phase to a gas phase. This also associates a charge with all of the peptides. These charged peptides then go through an accelerator, which results in separation. These separated peptides are then detected, which results in our MS1 spectra. Now let's take a closer look at this MS1 spectra. On the y-axis, we have relative abundance, and on the x-axis, we have MZ, which is the mass to charge ratio. Again, for the sake of simplicity, we will assume all these examples have a charge of one, although that is not always the case. So how is the mass to charge ratio helpful? Well, each amino acid has a unique mass associated with it, given in Daltons. Therefore, if we know the overall mass of the peptide, it gives us some idea of which amino acids are combined to make the peptide of that specific weight. However, there are multiple combinations of amino acids that can result in similar peaks. Furthermore, another challenge arises when looking at MS1 spectra, which is the order of the amino acids. Take, for example, the peptide shown here. If we use the chart to add up the masses of each amino acid and assume a charge one, this peptide would show up at about 573 mz. Now, what if this was our peptide? It has the same amino acids, but in a different order, which makes it a completely different peptide. Unfortunately, this peptide would also show up at around 573 mz. So how are we supposed to tell the difference between the two? Well, that's where our MS2 spectra comes in. We can program our mass spectrometer to run further analyzation of peaks of interest and create a mass spectra of the corresponding peptide. 
This peptide first goes through fragmentation. This process further breaks down the peptides by breaking them at their peptide bonds. We will discuss this further in a moment. After fragmentation, it once again goes through separation and detection, resulting in the MS2 spectra. Now, to understand fragmentation, we first need to take a look at a peptide molecule. A peptide is a small fragment of amino acids held together by peptide bonds, which are shown here. Additionally, peptides have an N terminal, which has an NH2 molecule, and a C terminal, which has a carboxyl group. The process of fragmentation will break the peptide at its peptide bonds, since they are the weakest bonds. At each break, you will see that there is a part of the fragment associated with the N-terminal and part of the fragment associated with the C-terminal. The fragments associated with the N-terminal are called B-ions, and the fragments associated with the C-terminal are called Y-ions. Understanding this, let's now look at our peptide of interest. If we break this peptide at its first peptide bond, the associated B ion is G and the associated Y ion is DASNK. If we break this peptide at the second peptide bond, then the associated B ions are GD and the associated Y ions are ASNK. The same pattern will continue for the remainder of the peptide. On the right, we have the corresponding MS2 spectra. Remember, this is essentially a zoomed-in spectra of our peak of interest we found with the MS1 spectra. Each of the B ions and Y ions would ideally create a unique peak. You could then find the differences between neighboring B ion and Y ion peaks. For example, the difference between these neighboring Y ion peaks would ideally be 115 mz, which you could determine is the unique weight of a D amino acid. You could continue this process until you have identified each of the amino acids and their order, giving you the sequence of your selected peptide. The mass spectrometer will continue this process for all of the peaks of interest from the MS1 spectra, providing you with the sequence of the peptides and ultimately the sequence of the protein molecule. In addition to identifying the sequence of peptides, you can also identify post-translational modifications such as phosphorylation. To do so, it's important to note that the three primary amino acids that undergo phosphorylation are serine, threonine, and tyrosine. So let's go back to our previous example and peptide of interest. In this particular peptide, if it were to be phosphorylated, only the serine amino acid would be able to be phosphorylated. Now, how might this show in our MS2 spectra? Our original peptide in MS2 spectra is shown at the top. If this peptide was phosphorylated as seen at the bottom, this is an example of what the MS2 spectra could look like. You'll notice that there is a unique peak that occurs around 80 Daltons when a molecule is phosphorylated. Additionally, the phosphate group has its own associated weight, so all the peptide fragments the phosphate group is attached to are now heavier. By identifying these changes, mass spectrometry could be used to identify if phosphorylation has taken place. The final step in this workflow is data analysis. As I mentioned previously, we have been discussing mass spectrometry in an oversimplified manner to understand the basic concepts. However, the data you receive after running these experiments is never perfect, and the simple calculations we discussed are often unfeasible. As such, experimental data will be sent off to be compared to libraries of theoretical data, where the objective is to find the best match of theoretical data to your experimental data. One example of this is Sequest, which is a popular data analysis program used for protein identification. This program correlates experimental MS2 spectra of peptides against theoretical spectra of known peptide sequences in a sequence database. Sequest will then provide you with a score, which is a closeness of fit measure. Score values above two are usually indicative of a good match. To end, let's look at some real world examples of a good match and a poor match using Sequest. Here we have an MS2 spectra. The peaks that have been highlighted in red and blue are the library data that are matched to the observed spectra. 
The algorithm found that these spectra have a score of 2.510, suggesting that they are a good match and that this is likely the corresponding peptide sequence for this experimental spectra. Another interesting thing to notice is that Sequest also identified that the Y amino acid in this sequence has been phosphorylated. On the other hand, this is an example of a poor match. The Sequest score for these spectra is 0.449, which tells us that it is unlikely that this experimental spectra corresponds to this peptide sequence. Thank you all for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and now have a better understanding of mass spectrometry. This video was created by me, Gabriella Goodwin, as a member of Dr. Ryu's computational lab group and was funded by the National Science Foundation. Finally, I'd like to end by thanking Dr. Ryu, as well as the members of the PTM Educational Application Group and the remaining members of the Ryu Computational Lab Group, without whom this research would not be possible. Thank you.